Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 776. My name is Camden Busey. I'm in Libertyville, Illinois, as usual, and uh, back and excited to have another episode lined up. We're going to be talking about Presbyterian history. Of course, it's been on my mind a lot, and uh, love doing more and more of these episodes, digging in, of course, into our favorite era, the early 20th century in America. And to do that, we have with us a return guest, uh, Jeff McDonald, who's the pastor of Avery Presbyterian Church in Belleville, Nebraska. He's the author of John Gerstner and the Renewal of Presbyterian and Reformed Evangelicalism in Modern America, which we spoke about three years ago, I believe. And also the uh, the author of a new article that we're going to be speaking today that covers uh, some topics regarding Machen. But welcome to the program, Jeff. It's good to see you again. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much, Cameron, for having me. You bet. I, I uh, should let the listener know. Uh, that uh, we just reconnected last week. Uh, it seems a long time ago now. <laughs> a lot has happened. It's been a busy fall. But uh, down in Wheaton College, uh, one of your alma maters, uh, and we're able to uh, attend the Presbyterian Scholars Conference, which I've mentioned on this program before. But I can't say enough about that small little event. I just love it. I've been two years in a row. Thank you for the invitation. But uh, it's, it's spectacular. I'm wondering if you could let people know about this event, kind of how it came about and, uh, you know, how it has, you know, evolved, I suppose, or has come to its present form. Yeah. Uh, started in 2015 and, uh, I just looked around and I didn't, I couldn't find, you know, um, too many conferences that deal with, uh, Presbyterian history. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a lot of, different uh, conferences that are larger. There's some that focus on Reformation history, but uh, you know there w- weren't really any that I could find that dealt with kind of modern 20th century Presbyterian history. So we started in 2015, and, and uh, Don McLeod, um, who's a Canadian Presbyterian uh, historian, uh, helped me uh, get it off the ground, and we've been meeting now every year uh, since, and we've had uh, you know a lot of uh, good papers on Presbyterian history, a lot of, uh, you know, really good book panels. We try to, we try to mix it up, you know, with, uh, you know, early career scholars, yeah. mid-career and more senior scholars. We try to do that. And we also try to mix up the denominational affiliation. Oh yeah. That's what's fun. That All of it, it's very fun, but that's an interesting component. Yeah. We just feel like, uh, you know, bringing, different denominational traditions into the discussion is really important to get the different uh, perspectives on Presbyterian history. And so we, you know, I've had, uh, you know, OPC, PCUSA, EPC, um, Presbyterian Church in Canada, PCA, uh, Reformed Presbyterian um, speaker. So we've, we've really, we've tried to, to mix, uh, to mix it up and get uh, different, different voices there. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, it, it's fascinating about uh, some of the list of names of people that are that have come and delivered in the past. And you know, the two times I've been there, we've had Mark Knoll and George Marsden, Brad Gunlock, uh, Bradley Longfield, uh, a whole host of people. Uh, Danny Olinger's presented, Daryl Hart. I don't want to leave people out, but I mean, it's it's you walk in and I'm just like a kid in a candy store, proverbially speaking, and get to just sit and listen to all these really fun presentations. But uh, also, the, there are a lot of book panels. Can you describe the thought behind those? Because I think those are some of the the richest opportunities to hear people talk and interact regarding their ideas. Yeah, the book panels um, have been a big you know part of it and a lot of good discussion, really, really stimulating discussion. And uh, we try to, you know, we try to, have panels on, you know, books that people are interested in. And, uh, and we, you know, we try to, um, you know, have different perspectives presented on those panels too. So that, that creates, I think, a good discussion. I think we saw that, <laughs> we saw that last week with some of the, I was at a fist fight. Break. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lively discussion and for good reason, but it was, that was a fun, fun discussion. We were talking about, uh, some things, uh, yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah, we and we and that's what we want. We want to have, um, you know, lively discussion, sure. and not uh, just have you know panelists that that are just uh, all of the same perspective or yeah. just you know praising the book. There need you know we want uh, 
uh, critique, um, and that's that's important. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. So we'll typically have a relatively recent book, or maybe there's an an, a a book that an anniversary of a of a classic book that was published a while ago, and that author will be there, right? And then you you coordinate with a few other scholars, so maybe three or four people might offer their critique and comment on the book in question. And then at the end, the author gets to respond to all of them. And then after that, anyone who's there can offer their comments or ask any questions. I find that that's just tremendous. It's really yeah. fun. It's kind of the way scholarship ought to proceed, that people can offer those open comments and then you can interact with those ideas. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. It's doing it all in person too is really exciting rather than just uh, there's a place for print and that's really important, uh, especially for longevity, but, uh, being able to do that and then go have dinner with someone is, is pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, one of the strongest, you know, uh, parts of the conference is just the fellowship part of it. Um, and we want to, you know, even increase that in the future and mm-hmm. make opportunities for fellowship. But that's one of the things that we receive is just people really, um, enjoy the interaction, yeah. the opportunity to talk to people. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, we can uh, provide more information on that if people are interested. You can write in to us at least. We can pass things on to Jeff if people would like. We're at mail at reformedforum.org. Is there any other way uh, other than us forwarding inquiries to you, Jeff, where if people were interested or had some thoughts about this where they might follow up? Yeah, they could. You know, you can email me at uh, jsmcdonald. 47 at gmail.com. Okay. You asked yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah, please email if you'd like to come. No, it's good. Uh, that would be fun. We hope maybe we'll see some new faces next time. And and uh, has every con- uh, conference been held at Harbor House at, at Wheaton College uh, so far? Has that been the typical place? Uh, yeah, there was one. In 2015, we actually had two conferences Ooh. in 2015. And the first one was in March, and that was at the Harbor House. And then uh, uh, Wheaton College moved us uh, to a different location. Okay. Uh, but all the other ones have been at the Harbor House. But they've been at Wheaton. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Well, maybe we'll see some new people uh, next year. We're looking forward to that. That's going to be exciting. Well, today we're looking to speak about uh, Jeff's recent article, which is titled Advancing the Evangelical Mind. Melvin Grove Kyle, Jay Gresson Machen, and the League of Evangelical Students. Uh, I linked to this in a previous episode of Crisis Center. Jeff, this has not been published yet, the previous episode, but we're you see we're out of time here because we record and it takes some time for these podcasts to come out. But this is an open access uh, article um, published by, uh, I'm not exactly certain, the the article itself says religions and it's through MDPI. Maybe you can uh, offer some insight into this open access venue. But the article uh, is fully available uh, in full text online or as a PDF, and there'll be a link to that in the episode description. But uh, Jeff, tell us about this uh, publication and and uh, tell us a little bit about the when it came out, just this summer, right? Uh, yeah, 20... 20- 2021. Oh, last summer. summer. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Religions is just an academic online uh, journal. And I received an email from uh, Randall Balmer, who's a professor of religion at Dartmouth College. And he was uh, publishing a special uh, series in the journal on new directions and evangelical Mm. scholarship. And so I had uh, some work on Kyle and Matron and the League of Evangelical Students. And I sent them to him and he, uh, uh, published it. So very thankful to Randall um, and the other and the other editors as well. Absolutely. No, it's very high quality, uh, not just the the piece itself, but uh, the journal. And I'm glad to have found it. I uh, should have known about it before, but I'm glad through you to to get this. And I just love the, also the idea of open access, uh, that we were able to to put this out in a scholarly way, but yet in a way where it's freely accessible to people uh, who would like to learn and grow in their understanding. So um, I, I have heard about some of these organizations that Machen had been involved in. We're going to be speaking mostly about uh, Melvin Grove Kyle, but the overlap here with uh, Jay Gress and Machen, of course, a figure that is well known to our particular audience. Uh, but I wonder if you could set the stage for us a little bit, as, as every good historian should do when we're introducing uh, uh, the subject of study. What context are we, are we speaking about here and, and lead us on into this 
interaction between Machen, uh, Melvin Grove Kyle, a biblical archaeologist, and uh, this student group that they that they founded jointly. Yeah, well, um, Machen, you know, obviously is well known for uh, founding the OPC and the Independent Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions and for founding Westminster Seminary. Mm -hmm. Uh, But another, you know, organization that he founded was the League of Evangelical Students. And uh, so this this paper goes into his work in that organization and what he was trying to accomplish. And, uh, you know, in the course of you know, research on it, you know, discovered, uh, you know, that he had relationships with United Presbyterian uh, scholars and had gone to uh, St. Louis on a couple of occasions. I think he went both times with Robert Dick Wilson and uh, visited Xenia Seminary. So there was, you know, there was relationships that were being built there in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Machen and Princeton Seminary students founded this organization and um, and then they asked uh, Melvin Grove Kyle, the president of Xenia Seminary, uh, to also be on the board. And so Machen and Kyle were the two president, uh, the two Presbyterians on the board. Mm-hmm. Tell us a bit about Xenia and the UPs. I I was born into the UPC USA. That that's uh, I was a Covenant child. Uh, so this is only a few years before. Uh, the PC USA, as we now know it, was was formed when it merged with the PC US. So there's there's a bit of UP history in me <laughs> somehow in uh, crossing my biography. But um, Xenia, if I'm not mistaken, is the oldest Presbyterian seminary, isn't it? Uh, it was a late yeah. or mid late 18th century, but uh, yeah. not 1794. Yeah, there you go. But not not too many people necessarily know uh, Machen's interactions or Machen's overlap with with Xenia or here even with the League of Evangelical Students. But um, what is why is why do you think this is somewhat of a maybe maybe not forgotten part of Presbyterian history, but certainly one that hasn't received as much attention as we might expect. Well, so one one thing is that uh, it's a little bit confusing. Um, first of all, the the mainline church uh, from 58, 1958 mm-hmm. to 1983 was called the UPC USA. Yeah. And it, so in 58, it added the U yeah. because they, they were able to get a smaller Presbyterian denomination, which was the UPC NA, NA. joint UPC USA. And so uh, that created the UPC USA. So there's just that confusion. Um, uh, you know, that's added to it. And so mm-hmm. I think some people, um, you know, don't realize that there was this earlier United Presbyterian exactly. Church yes. that was about 10% of the size of the mainline church in 1958. And so mm-hmm. the UPCNA, you know, just has its own traditions, its own history, its own type of scholarship. And so what happened, I think, in the mid-1920s, um, you know, from the evidence that we have is that when Machen and the Princeton Seminary fa- students founded the League of Evangelical Students, they really couldn't find any other PCUSA seminary presidents or administrators to support it. Mm-hmm. But Machen was able to find a United Presbyterian seminary president to support uh, the League of Evangelical Students. And that's Melvin Grove Kyle. Mm-hmm. What uh, what is Melvin Grove Kyle's background? You, you you speak of him. He's a he's a scholar, a very well known, accomplished scholar, with the president of a seminary. But he, uh, he's coming up as a biblical archaeologist. Uh, yeah. what, you know, speak a bit about that discipline, especially at this particular time in history. It's an interesting development and adds adds some color to this story here. Well, yeah, in the late 19th, early 20th century, the United Presbyterian Church of North America had very strong uh, missions and uh, was involved in a lot of you know, missionary engagement. In fact, it had the highest uh, per capita giving to missions of any American denomination. And the one, one of the places where the United Presbyterians were very strong in was in Egypt. Hmm. And so Kyle 
uh, was a, pa a UP pastor in Philadelphia and his church members were going to Egypt and doing missions work and he was going there and he was on the, the missions board for the UP church. And so he developed this interest in biblical archaeology and with, uh, Bibl or with archaeologists from the University of Pennsylvania. And he, um, they actually asked him to do archaeological research there. And uh, that really developed um, into a, a career for him. And he became one of the first or one of the early you know, biblical archaeologists and did excavations there with some of the greatest names in the whole history of, you know, Near Eastern archaeology. Mm. Uh, but he remained, you know, a very conservative uh, Protestant and, uh, you know, a very um, strong defender of the faith. And he tried to influence, Kyle tried to influence, you know, famous archaeologists. And uh, one of the most famous that he influenced was William Foxwell Albright, who became really the dean of biblical archaeologists archeolog mm. and was a longtime professor at Johns Hopkins. And Albright started out his career as a radical skeptic of the Bible, uh, but through his relationship with Kyle, uh, he came uh, to a more centrist uh, position. Interesting. Well, Kyle, um, this whole story, you know, as you write uh, in this article, is that this study is important because it helps us grasp how evangelical Protestantism rehabilitated and advanced itself intellectually. Uh, tell us a bit about this period and why that was an important project. I think that gets us, helps us to get us into the mind of, of Kyle and Machen a little bit in terms of their purpose for this organization. But what what is significant about the culture and why was it a struggle for, how were Christians, I should say, being marginalized intellectually? Yeah, so I think in the in the mainline denominations, uh, liberal theology was becoming, you know, stronger, and it was taking over seminaries, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, secular education was just really, you know, advancing uh, throughout the academy, and so Machen and these Princeton seminary students, they were upset with uh, an inter-seminary group that was, uh, that they were a part of that was promoting, you know, liberal biblical scholarship and more liberal theology. And so they, they did not want to be a part of that anymore. And so they separated and created this organization, you know, the League of Evangelical Students. And so I think, you know, what, uh, if you look at the magazine uh, for the, for the league, um, you know, they are promoting, you know, different scholars, they're promoting uh, different uh, articles on uh, different theological and you know, topics. And so, and they're also promoting a lot of books in there. So this mm. is an effort by Machen and Kyle and others to, you know, uh, help students and uh, different people to, um, you know, to develop Christian minds and to be encouraged as, you know, undergraduates or graduate students, you know, in their, in their work. And they were trying to show that, you know, modern scholarship has not made conservative Christianity untenable. Mm -hmm. So they're pushing back, you know, very hard uh, against that. What kind of activities were they involved in? I mean, are there, I guess I should also ask, are there any antecedents to this organization or competing <laughs> student groups who are, who are like the league of anti-evangelical students or something? Where, where does this come from, this idea, this germ of uh, starting a student group? And what did they do at it? Well, I know that colleges had the, you know, the YMCA, student, mm -hmm. you know, groups. There's other Christian ministries, you know, on campuses. But this was uh, really a more conservative uh, effort uh, because, you know, Protestantism was being split between more liberal and conservative factions. And so, uh, you know, Machen is really trying to um, get as many people involved in this as possible. And I think the group goes from, uh, in 1925, I think they had, you know, just a few on, on a few campuses and, and by the late thirties, they're on 60 campuses. So, uh -huh. so the group, the organization really did grow. They had uh, chapters at all sorts of different colleges, Christian colleges, state universities, uh, many Ivy leagues, you know, universities had a chapter of the League of Evangelical Students. Um, they had uh, regional conferences 
um, they they had in an, an, a national conference every year. And so Machen was traveling to different, uh, uh, you know, local chapters, but also he went to regional chapters and uh, he spoke at many of the national uh, conventions. Mm-hmm. You know, as I'm, I'm digging through presently, you know, thoughts and researching Ned Stonehouse. Ned Stonehouse was uh, really, uh, well, the junior colleague to Machen at Westminster in New Testament. And then when Machen passed away, Stonehouse carried on not all, but a lot of uh, his labors and, and work and became a key figurehead in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. But I found the more I'm studying, you know, that, that Stonehouse and Machen seem to have more similar ideas about ecumenical involvement and um, a breadth of that. They're both very strong confessionalists, so they're not compromising on their confession or the theology at all, uh, but they still approach, they have a different, it's hard to, for me to put my finger on this, and as my research is developing, you know, you're tossing out ideas and thinking through things, so these are all, a lot of these are nascent thoughts, but they have a different posture than maybe some of the other folks in the OPC, uh, early OPC, like John Murray and Cornelius Van Til, R.B. Kuyper, other heroes of mine. But it's interesting to see different ideas here. And, and Stonehouse is very much involved in early ecumenical efforts to get the OPC involved and connected to other churches. And some people didn't like Stonehouse's proposals. He thought they weren't, weren't as confessionally based as they ought to be, and they, they need to have stronger relations and, and ties through the confession. But my my question here is is your sense of things regarding Machen and his involvement. Machen was out there. He's a busy guy, and he's involved in all sorts of different things. And um, it's it's interesting for me to, to see this, especially in, the, in 1925. Uh, there's plenty for him to be involved with at Princeton. I mean, they're going through... Uh, all sorts of studies and investigations and looking into uh, all sorts of stuff uh, formally, but yet he's still out there speaking at different conferences, starting new uh, organizations and being involved with a a wider range of people, not just UPs, uh, but Baptists, all sorts of fundamentalists too. Uh, What, you know, as a student of and historian of evangelicalism in America, I mean, is this typical? Is Machen unique? What, what do you think? Uh, do you have any thoughts on on his involvement and in, and uh, what this particular student group might, or this particular effort with Kyle might disclose about him? Yeah, I mean, one of the things they talked about in the obituary that appeared in in the organization's magazine um, was that Machen that students were close to his heart, mm. that he loved students, and he would send free books. You know, to students, there was a you know an offer in the magazine that Machen would send. You know, we'll send you these books if you just send your name. And so I think um, I think he just really you know cared about people. He cared uh, about their spiritual development, and he didn't want uh, he didn't want people students to be intimidated. Mm. Um, you know, by unbelieving professors or you know liberal <laughs> liberal critics, you know. Um, So, you know, what's interesting about this organization that he started is that many of the next generation, some of the best conservative Protestant scholars, you know, really come out of this Hmm. organization that Machen uh, started. So I think that's, you know, uh, another contribution of his in terms of shepherding, you know, students and, and, but also I think, you know, organizing different professors across the country to su- support, you know, a lot of the critique that he had against, you know, liberal Protestantism. Mm-hmm. And that's what we see in the different articles, you know, all sorts of different professors who are lining up against um, modernist mm-hmm. scholarship. Certainly. I, you know, it. do you find a similar motivation for Melvin Grove Kyle that he also saw I guess I'm I'm wondering how they partnered up together not just circumstantially but did they see something in each other mutually that 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 drew them to be co-laborers together I guess uh you know maybe it's a an a question that can't be answered but why these two at this point in time with this 
particular endeavor? Is it just happen? Uh, are they hanging with each other on conference circuit and had a late night and decided, hey, let's start a student group or what? <laughs> What's going on here with these two figures? Yeah, I think I think Machen, you know, was aware of these United Presbyterian scholars. Um, some of them, you know, going back a decade before this, had been involved in uh, the Bible League. Mm. I think it was the Bible League of America, and they had a, a magazine. And so you see Kyle appearing on the pages there along with, you know, Benjamin Warfield. And so they had some, you know, they had some type of relationship. But when I looked at you know, the Xenia seminary catalogs uh, from the 1920s, that's where I discovered that Machen actually had been going to Xenia mm. uh, to, to present relationships so I, or to present papers. So I don't know, I, you know, the, I, I'm assuming that's how those relationships, you know, really developed more. Um, but I, I did not find, I haven't found any correspondence between Kyle and Machen. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder what uh, what might be out there. That might be a question for for Daryl Hart at some point to see if he recalls anything of the sort. The Machen archives, even just at Westminster, are just massive. Uh, mm-hmm. And it'd be nice if those were digitized and cataloged. But there's, you know, maybe we can find a donor who'd be willing to to fund that effort uh, for Westminster so that the the likes of you and I can <laughs> can read those from a distance. That would be a great benefit to scholarship, but. It's just very intriguing to me uh, to think about Machen's interaction here, not only with Kyle, but also with Xenia Seminary. Um, You know, you write that Kyle Machen and the LES challenged evangelicals to take the life of the mind seriously, and their work laid the foundation for a resurgent evangelicalism that was increasingly intellectually engaged. Uh, In what ways do we we see that coming out of, you know, the the mid-20s? what type of appreciable effect did this league have on students? And you mentioned some of the key figures coming on. Who were some of those folks and what did they end up doing as engaged evangelicals? Yeah, I mean, there's just uh, many, many of that next generation were involved in, in this organization. You know, George Eldon Ladd mm. uh, at Fuller Seminary, mm-hmm. professor there. He was on the executive student committee for this organization. And I think 1932, 31, 32, I think is the dates, Um, you know, um, W. Stanford Reed was writing for this uh, organization's journal. Mm. Uh, Vernon Grounds, who later became the longtime president of Denver Seminary, um, you know, a Baptist, but that was someone, you know, uh, who was, uh, I think he was the vice president of the League of Evangelical Students, student vice president. and, you know, many, uh, you know, many others, Kenneth Conser, who became the lead, the leading, you know, dean of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He was converted mm. at a League of Evangelical Students, uh, you know, ministry in, a camp, in that campus ministry there at Ashland College. So really some big, some big name uh, evangelicals of the next generation, um, you know, really, uh, you know, um, were impacted by this effort. Hmm. What uh, what happened to the to the league over the years? Did it develop? Did it merge? Does it still exist? Can we join it? <laughs> no. Uh, well, unfor- you know, unfortunately, Kyle died in 1933, mm. and so that was you know unfortunate. Um, and then, and I think if, if Kyle would have lived on, I think there would have been more United Presbyterian support for the league and for Machen. Um, and then obviously Machen died January 1937. So mm-hmm. that really hurt, you know, the league. Uh, it continued on for about five more years after Machen's death. And then it uh, it, it shut down, I think, in 1943. And um, I think part of it was that InterVarsity Christian Fellowship had, you know, come into the United States mm-hmm. and was growing and gotten stronger. And, and so um, it's kind of superseded by that by that ministry. But this was kind of an early, inter, somewhat like InterVarsity, somewhat like Campus Crusade type right. organization. Yeah, that's interesting to me to, to, to think about this. We had um, 
on the program not too long ago, Arlen Migliazzo, who you had invited to our to the uh, Presbyterian Scholars Conference last year, and he was able to present on his recent biography of Henrietta Mears. That's what we spoke with him about on the program, and it was fascinating to see Mears's leadership and influence on evangelicalism, but also her concern for young people and how many people, uh, folks like Bill Bright, that came up uh, through her ministry, so to speak, uh, her efforts and her service in the church. Uh, I'm curious, do you think, uh, did Mears have any involvement or awareness of, of the history of this organization, or do any of these other campus ministries uh, or people involved in campus ministries, uh, did they have any explicit knowledge of of Kyle and Machen, or is this more or less just a, an historical I don't know, something that kind of helped to set the stage, but something that wasn't explicitly in the mind of people that would come a few decades later. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure on the, I think Mears, you know, was probably aware of it, but I don't know. Um, I wasn't really um, looking too much at uh, her involvement. I don't, sure. I don't think she was ever involved as far as I know, but she, she may have had some, uh, involvement. Um, I would need to look at the chapters that existed in Minneapolis and then went out to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I need to look at those years again. I know they did have a chapter at the University of Minnesota. Um, there was a woman math professor there who, uh, was the faculty sponsor. And that group primarily was made up of women students at the University of Minnesota. And they invited Machen to the University of Minnesota to speak, and he did come. Yeah. And the report in the magazine was that there was four University of Minnesota professors that came to hear him speak. And I think there was either, like, I think maybe 100 plus people in attendance. And uh, there was a small Presbyterian church right on the border of the campus that was uh, uh, a strong supporter of the LES. Um, so, man. The gophers, the golden gophers are getting at it against liberalism. <laughs> that's, yeah. uh, you know, another thing that's interesting about this history uh, and something you point out in the article is that this institution and its development and then its its activities uh, demonstrate really kind of a, a pan-Presbyterian descent uh, from theological liberalism. Certainly that would extend beyond just Presbyterianism to other uh other traditions as well. But um, is this unique, do you think, uh, in terms of institutions, or were there other examples of, of a pan-Presbyterian uh, dissent or cooperation to fight against liberalism? Yeah, well, let me, let me just back up just one moment. Sure. The interesting thing about that church on the edge of the University of Minnesota campus is that it was pastored by a, uh, one of Machen's former students, Evan Walsh. Mm. Evan Welsh, who became chaplain of Wheaton College later on. So that's kind of a little bit of interesting history there, too. I think, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, there's been definitely there was United Presbyterians were very concerned about, uh, you know, the theological liberalism of the PCUSA. And in the early 1930s, they were able to reject a PCUSA effort to try to consolidate uh, or merge the denominations. Uh, so it, from what I can tell, I mean, there were, um, yeah, conservative Presbyterians, you know, uh, in the PCSA and in the United Presbyterian Church and in these other denominations uh, who worked together, maybe not necessarily a formal organization, but they were definitely, uh, you know, working together and, and had awareness of different things that were going on. And sometimes we see this in the different uh, periodicals of of that period i think of like mm. the earlier christian today that machin oh yeah started. craig's yeah and it's interesting they they were paying attention uh you know to kyle and what he was doing and they have a, a large obituary in there about him i just that's just one small thing but sure but i i think this is one way that conservatives in the different presbyterian denominations were able to come together and do something uh to oppose liberalism uh, also on the board of the LES was William Childs Robinson, mm. who uh, another former, you know, Machen student. 
and then did a PhD at Harvard. And then he was for many years, the, he was a long time professor of church history at Columbia Theological Seminary mm -hmm. uh, in the Presbyterian Church US. Yeah, down south. My goodness. Yeah, that's <clears throat> important and uh, significant. And I'm curious here, you know, if there's something, there seems to me something unique about campus ministry and the particular challenges of the young people have uh, at college, you know, battling with ideas. And in many ways, it's a transitional phase in our culture for the folks that end up going off to, you know, uh, undergraduate work or graduate work, that there's a particular need uh, to bolster students and help them uh, kind of disciple them along, especially when they're being bombarded with all sorts of other ideas. So I definitely see the significance and um, the importance of a campus ministry. I myself benefited from one greatly. I, I was in Campus Crusade for Christ later in my undergraduate years, and that's where I met my wife. So you could say it did something for me. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. but um, I, do you get a sense that Kyle and others were uh, – I don't know. Again, these are these are just hypothetical questions. I'm just a asking off the top of my head. But um, do you get a sense that they're looking at other opportunities? You know, seeking to create institutions, or or is this a unique instance? Machen was involved in lots of stuff. You know, in terms of uh, the OPC that became necessary in his mind uh, when the PCUSA had proven to be in his in their estimation, you know, a, a church that was not just anymore, not even following its own constitution um, and not engaging in biblical discipline properly. So they have to, they were required to form another church. They had the independent board of foreign missions and they thought that was necessary because the church was promoting modernism and uh, engaging in missions that was saying Jesus Christ isn't the exclusive way to salvation. So that was necessary. You know, I could see how you, you're looking at, you know, the needs of, of Christian students. And if there isn't an organization providing uh, for these particular people in their particular challenges, that they seek to develop an institution for that sort of thing. But is this just in the air? Is this unique to Machen? Is it unique to Kyle? Or is this something that, that many people were involved with? Uh, what are your sense of that? What is your sense of that in the early 20th century? Yeah, well, I think I think Machen, you know, he was an institution builder, mm -hmm. and um, I think this is, you know, this organization hasn't received as much attention as the other institutions sure. that he's built. But I think this is a significant organization. Most of the national conventions uh, for the LES were held at, uh, you know, seminaries or colleges, uh, but there was one held, I think, in 1935 at Point Breeze Presbyterian Church. And I think that at that time. Akinge was the pastor of the church. And so it was kind of amazing that oh. they would, would, would have one there. Um, and then obviously, you know, he would go on to found other, you know, organizations and institutions uh, or, or help lead them in the case. Yeah, of he's a pretty big name. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there's definitely a, a legacy here. And, um, you know, I, I just think it's... Um, you know, a legacy that uh, deserves to be re remembered. I think it shows that, you know, Machen's influence, it shows some some of his influence in parts of uh, church history that we're, we may not be familiar with. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think he really did, you know, shape minds and influence people. One of the interesting people I came across in this study was the president of Hampton Sydney College, who had given Machen an honorary uh, doctorate hmm. and Machen had preached there. And this president, James Eagleston, had formerly been uh, a materialist. No. Um, he had previously been president of Virginia Tech and then for many years was president of Hampton, Sydney, um, and was a very strong uh, Christian. Uh, but interestingly, you know, at that time when this president of Hampton, Sydney was supporting the League of Evangelical Students, you know, one of the students at the college was Francis Schaefer. <laughs> so how much how much involvement did he have in this? You know, wow. Uh, but I know that, you know, Schaefer was reading Machen and was really inspired by Machen, too. So what's the uh, what do you think is the the enduring legacy of Melvin Grove Kyle? 
on <laughs> evangelical scholarship? And why, you know, do you think uh, uh, that we should revisit him or study him more often? And if so, you know, why and how? Well, I think he's important because he was really um, one of the, you know, the best conservative Protestant biblical archaeologists in the early 20th century. He was really, you know, doing the hard work of going over to the Holy Land, doing the excavations, the, you know, you know, writing them up, uh, you know, working with many of the most world's most famous, you know, archaeologists. And I got to say, this is the era of Indiana Jones, too. Right? Yes. <laughs> The fictional Indiana Jones, but a lot of that has to do with with work that was being done at the University of Chicago at the time, back yeah. in the in the third early twentieth century, thirties, and on into the forties and stuff. So it's interesting. He, He's he a real made, life uh, Indiana Jones. He made Xenia uh, Seminary a center for biblical archaeological you know scholarship, and the you know the. Xenia merged with Pitt Xenia and then ultimately became Pittsburgh Seminary. And the, the biblical archaeology museum that Kyle started still exists today oh. um, as the Kelso uh, Museum for Near, Near Eastern Archaeology at Pittsburgh Seminary. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, the other contribution of Kyle is that he was one of the he was the uh, revising editor of the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia hmm. that he he worked on with James Orr, and that's really a, a united Presbyterian effort to get that. That's a massive five-volume work, you know, published in 1915, and that uh, Orr, you know, as I mentioned in this paper, literally worked himself to death, you know, to finish. <laughs> Goodness. And uh, I know Machen, um, you know, admired that, admired the Isby. Mm -hmm. I know that he really admired uh, William Park Armstrong's article in there on New Testament chronology. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, Wilbur Smith talks about uh, Machen, you know, coming to his library one day and talking about the importance of that article and how significant it is. Mm -hmm. So That's fascinating. What uh, did, were you surprised at all when you were researching this article? I guess I should have asked to, to begin with, how did, how did it come about? But as you're digging in and researching, did anything you know, surprise you or any unsuspecting facts arise that uh, really caught you off guard? I think what was most surprising to me and uh, what I would just encourage your listeners, you know, it, I think it, it shows just, you know, all the different relationships that nature had with people that you might not uh, realize. And it just mm -hmm. shows the the extent of really his ministry and what he was able to uh, accomplish. And I think it shows too, uh, one of the things they talk about is just how Machen was willing, the magazine in the obituary talks about how Machen was willing to travel hundreds and hundreds of miles just to meet with a small group of students. Yeah. So as we think about Machen, we just need to remember his, you know, great passion to help students and to, uh, you know, provide spiritual encouragement and to, and to help them grow, uh, you know, their, their, Christian minds in a way that they can, um, you know, deal with some of the assaults that they were facing or some of the challenges that they were facing. So. Yeah. That has always fascinated me too, especially, and it's not necessarily easy to get to these places either. It's not as if a uh, Machen's got a private jet and he just jumps on and shows up at uh, the student group at the university of Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I recall, uh, uh, in, uh, the biography of EJ Young, written by his his son Davis he just recounts how all these guys uh early faculty members at Westminster are traveling the country but a lot of times they're driving across country in these yeah. old cars and you know we don't have the modern quality anymore they were built like tanks you know in terms of their <laughs> structure but he, he'd have to stop uh you know on a trip from philadelphia to california and back i think he ended up changing seven flat tires <laughs> or something and and it's just you don't think about that but that's in many ways the lengths that they were willing to to go to connect with people to uh, advance the confessional and conservative cause and to engage in this ministry. And at least to my knowledge, I haven't read a, a majority of it, but you don't find in their correspondence them, you know, trying to come up uh, uh, or negotiating fees for, you know, how much they're going to get paid to, <laughs> to make it worth their while to get somewhere. This is just something they did. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, I think <clears throat> the, the scholars that were involved in the organization and the, the other elite leaders, I think they really accomplished some, some really wonderful things. I, and I, I believe it, it deserves to be remembered. And in my own, you know, personal case, I wrote a biography of John Gerstner mm-hmm. and John Gerstner's mentor, uh, John Orr, who is a professor of Bible at Westminster College in Pennsylvania. He was involved in the organization and spoke at a national convention um, in Philadelphia where Machen also spoke. So there's you know, just a, a history there that's really rich and, and deserves, you know, deserves our attention. Yeah. So big picture, let connect back to Gerstner and Xenia, Kyle here. What's going on with the with the Presbyterians in Pittsburgh? What's in the is there something in the water? What uh, I mean, in a good sense, like uh, we've got we've got such a rich history there. I'm curious if uh, if what might account for it. Yeah, I think the you know the United Presbyterian tradition, um, you know, was a uh, you know fairly orthodox uh, denomination mm. and. Um, you know, the people involved in it uh, <clears throat> were, some of them were really receptive, you know, to what Machen was trying to do and really agreed with his critique of liberalism and how destructive it was for the church. Uh, so you had a lot of sympathy in the United Presbyterian Church for Machen. I think that continued on. And uh, Addison Leach, um, who was the president of Pitzinia in the in the uh, 40s, you know, he wanted to make it more conservative. And so that's why he hired, you know, John Gerstner. Mm. Uh, so then, you know, the Pitt Xenia faculty was just moving in a, you know, a much more conservative direction. And I think the, the PCUSA was worried about that. They did not want to have another Fuller Seminary, uh, you know, uh, situation in Pittsburgh. And so they moved, you know, to try to merge the denominations because they were very concerned about what was going on at Pitt in the 1950s and their, their support for a more conservative, uh, evangelical theological, you know, position and really a position that agreed with Machen's book, Christianity and liberalism. Hmm. We're coming up on the hundredth anniversary of that book next year. And, yes. uh, it's really, Really amazing to see how the Lord used that and continues to, because when we read that book today, you still feel as if it was just written. <laughs> because yeah. we don't encounter uh, modernism, you know, and classical modernism, you know, maybe has gone through many permutations, but at root, it's, uh, we still encounter the same theological challenges. And um, we need to be thankful and I think uh, remember uh, the lessons of the past that were learned by and taught by folks like Melvin Grove, Kyle and Jay Gress and Machen. But uh, it's just a good reminder that all this, even though we're, we're studying history that's a hundred years old, this, this stuff doesn't get stale when we actually get to the bottom of it and understand the significance of it. You know, yeah, that's the value of history. Hmm. So where do you yeah, think I mean, we, church or, history is really, really important for us. And I think, um, you know, I think, we're going to move forward we have to understand uh you know our past mm-hmm. and so christians you know <clears throat> we need to uh constantly be you know looking at our at our history and what we can learn you know from mm-hmm. it what outstanding questions do you think are there on this topic is there anything you know, any of the threads you'd like to pull on you know in future works are there any leads you might share with maybe young or even uh, even seasoned scholars where you think, oh, it'd be interesting if someone dove into X, Y, or Z. What remains to be learned? Yeah, that's a good question. I need to think about that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I, I think, um, yeah, they're just, <laughs> there's, so, there's so much here, I, I think, you know, just in terms of, <clears throat> the the evangelical leaders of the next generation, the conservative Protestant leaders of the next generation. Uh, I think it was, uh, you know, one, one OPC leader that came out of this or who was involved in this group was uh, Galbraith. Oh, sure. Um, Mr. OPC. Student, yeah. From Mus- Muskingum College, you know, mm-hmm. and, and so, uh, 
I delved into that. Who was the faculty mentor there? What what happened to that professor? And mm. uh, so I, you know, tracked that down. And uh, that guy actually became a, a president of Sterling College in Kansas and really helped, you know, solidify the Christian commitment of that college. And um, and so I, you know, I guess maybe in terms of this paper, maybe tracking down, you know, some more of these individuals and what they accomplished and. And, um, but you know, yeah, there's, that's there's the studies of, go ahead. we got to get into the, got to get into the archives. Uh, that's the, yeah. that's the difficult work people, but there's, there's work out there. So, I mean, the fact that there were several chapters might be interesting for people. If you're spread out there, you might not think you have access to any of the archives or resources that would be interesting, but I imagine that uh, some of these resources might exist at churches in your area or maybe, I don't know, universities in your area if they have uh, have had League of Evangelical student chapters. Uh, who never, you never know. There could, be a, there could be a treasure hidden under your nose. <laughs> you yep. can dig in there and take a look. That's interesting. What do you uh, what do you got cooking? Uh, uh, you have any other projects or books or articles that you're either reading and studying or working on writing yourself? Well, I'm right now. I'm working on um, a paper on Wilbur Smith, Wilbur mm-hmm. Moorhead Smith, and he was a friend of Machen's and a Presbyterian pastor and uh, pastor in <clears throat> Ocean City, Maryland, and then also in uh, Baltimore and was a real bibliophile and then became a professor at Moody and then the first professor hired by Fuller Seminary and uh, just kind of felt that he's been a neglected, you know, figure. Mm. And so I'm trying to uh, uh, work, finish a paper on him. Um, I have it finished, but I'm trying to do parts of it and things, but yeah. um, You're going to take that around and maybe we can see that in a journal uh, sometime soon. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. (laughs) Published. Well, we'll get there. We're going to re- start the campaign right now. So we're going <laughs> to make sure we find a home for that so we can read it. That's really, that's really exciting. And is there anything in store for the, for the Presbyterian Scholars Conference next year or, or just continuing on in the good course that you've already set? Yeah, we actually, we have, you know, a lot of people that uh, want to come back. We have, uh, I've received emails from uh, some different uh, professors who weren't there that want to be there. Mm. I do think maybe a panel discussion on Machen's book, Christian and Liberalism and its mm. influence and legacy, I think would be, you know, very, very appropriate. Uh, so yeah, we'd love to, anyone that would like to come, you know, just contact me and uh, we'd love to have you, you know, participate. Exciting. I really appreciate it. And again, uh, the article that we were ta- have been talking about today is Advancing the Evangelical Mind. Melvin Grove Kyle, Jay Gresson Machen, and the League of Evangelical Students. It's published in Religions, an open access journal. We've got a link to that in the episode description. You can get it, and it's uh, written by our guest today, Jeffrey S. McDonald. Jeff, thanks so much for joining me today and, and speaking about this. I really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks so much, Camden, and thanks, thanks for all you do. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you for that. That's very kind. And uh, we wanted to point people to all the necessary places online. We'll have links available in the episode description as well as to our previous conversation with Jeff on his uh, his book on John Gerstner. And uh, you can also find information about everything we're up to, including all of our online video courses we make available for free, our publications, and uh, other podcasts and programs. But I do want to thank everybody for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.